Hi, um, I'd like to reintroduce myself. I'm Micah Barrett. Um, I work for Rhode Island School of Design, um, both as a uh, graphic designer for their media department, um, and I teach in the graphic design department as well. Um, one of the courses that um, I teach um, and that RISD's graphic design department um, determines to be one of the most valuable fundamental courses to, um, to graphic designers and their ability to uh, communicate visually is through the, uh, through the discipline of typography. Um, that's dealing specifically with um, issues of the design of letters, the layout of pages, the structuring of information, and a lot of the issues that Neil was talking about in terms of kind of developing, maintaining um, hierarchy and those kinds of things. Um, so I thought um, I've, I've really enjoyed kind of giving this talk um, kind of after Neil's talk. I think Neil's talk does a great job of kind of like opening up our ideas about, you know, potential possibilities for ways that we can deal with delivering this information. Um, and then my job, I feel like, is to give you some more kind of concrete things, like uh, deliver some, some, some skills and some information that you can use in the, uh, the tools that you're already kind of um, engaging with on a regular basis, um, and hopefully kind of give you some, uh, some additional kind of clarity in, in that world. Um, and so the, the first kind of thing that I'd like to do is kind of talk about some of the, the myths that I hear about, um, or the, the kind of common misunderstandings of issues that people talk about when they talk about fonts. Um, uh, most of, one of them is uh, font size. Um, and oftentimes, like in the, in the context of a, an academic environment, you talk about, OK, a font needs to be in a paper at you know, 12 point, and that needs to, you, that's the appropriate font size. Um, and so this can actually be pretty misleading, because unlike uh, you know, inches, centimeters, those kinds of things are if I'm going to measure uh, my hand to this table. Um, the, the font size doesn't actually um, have much to do with the letter form itself, and it actually is the invisible box that uh, it's sitting in. Um, references, yes, references the container that it lives in. And so this is a, one of the first conventions of movable type, um, and it continues to live with us in the digital age. Um, so, you know, this H lives in a, uh, in a small kind of lead box that is 12 points, which is um, a very small unit of measure. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with the size of that H. Um, and we can see kind of how that exists in the, in the digital world today and all of the font files on your computers, on your iPads, those kinds of things. It still has what's called a, a glyph space. Um, and so in this context, uh, both fonts are the same size at 100 point, um, but we notice that the serif font is actually significantly smaller um, with this line that kind of um, bifurcates the, uh, the, the, the letter forms. And you know, this doesn't look like a very dramatic kind of issue right now when we're looking at just two, two words um, in a large size on, this, um, on the screen. But you know, once you're kind of dealing with lots of text, uh, that can add up quite quickly. Um, when I was an undergrad, I used to uh, use Helvetica for all of my term papers because it's significantly larger and I would have to write less. Um, <laughs> So the other issue um, that I want to talk about is the issue of, of, of word shape. Um, this one is very important to me. Um, there, there are other inclinations that people have to make pieces of information easier to read by setting them in all caps. Um, and while this can work for small pieces of information, uh, we lose the recognizable word shapes, and our text blocks is reduced to sort of an impenetrable set of rectangles. Um, word shape is, is something that I think is very important in the uh, the example that I like to cite um, for my students, for myself, is um, if I'm looking at my, uh, at my phone when I get a text message, um, and maybe I don't have my glasses on or I'm a little groggy, and I see the word shape of, uh, of a name of somebody I might have an affection for, I don't even read their name, but I see the kind of the skyline that is made of, their, uh, of, of those letters, um, and I can, I can recognize that, that name, and I can either be excited to hear from that person or be like, eh. Um, and so you can see where this, uh, this problem um, exacerbates itself in large chunks of text. So we kind of go from the same, um, the same information here, and uh, once we put it into all caps, um, it just turns into this blob of, of rectangles, and it's really hard to, um, it's really hard to identify those, those symbols that the, that the words make up. Um, the other thing that I want to uh, kind of address is there's this, there's this um, I noticed this in, in architects and um, some graphic designers and scientists too, the, the full justification seems like something that you really want to do because it makes a really lovely, uh, a lovely kind of crisp rectangle. We lose the sort of uh, 
you know, ragged, um, ragged uh, edge uh, on the right side of that, of that text block. Um, but, but please just, please never do this. Um, the reason that I say that is um, the spaces between the words now become so large that we're, not only can we not uh, penetrate these kind of crazy rectangles, but now there are these crazy spaces in between the words and it's very uncomfortable and slow and I just want to forget about it. So yes, red X, don't do that. Um, kind of in, in addition to, to this, there's been a lot of discussion um, pertaining to, you know, sans serif versus serif in terms of which is more legible. Um, and this actually has less to do with the presence of little feet on the letters and more to do with the defining shapes of each letter and ultimately each word. So, you know, issues of um, their proportions, the contrast, how much, um, you know, in this case it's black space, but we use the term white space, kind of comes through, uh, you know, that lowercase e, that lowercase a, um, those kinds of things. That's kind of what leads to a type being more uh, legible versus less legible. Um, Futura is, uh, is a fairly kind of common one. Um, this one I feel is very problematic for um, setting um, in blocks of text like this. Um, this might be maybe the most you could kind of get away with it. Um, if I ever try to read a book that's set in Futura, I go crazy because the lowercase a's look like the lowercase o's, look like the lowercase c's. Um, there aren't those kind of small defining characteristics to help with uh, the assistance of that word shape. Um, the, a lot of like the color of the page kind of comes through and it's just, it's, it's tough. Um, times on the other hand, um, you can see the difference between times in, in, in this case um, and another type called publico. Um, the lowercase letters um, are much kind of larger. Um, that can work for a variety of sizes and reading contexts. And I think like the one thing that um, it's easy to kind of forget when you're kind of given a computer with tons of fonts on them and little to no kind of conversation or guidance about why those fonts were made in the first place. Um, it's easy to forget that a lot of uh, types are, are designed and drawn for specific uh, use contexts. So, you know, Publico text um, is made for setting in text. Um, Futura might work very well for titles or, or subheads, but, you know, once again, looking at that in like a lot of, um, a lot of text in a book or something like that will be uh, very diff uh, uncomfortable. Um, this, this type, for instance, Bauhaus 93, um, I would not set maybe more than three words in, in this thing, and I wouldn't use it uh, probably at all, but if I, if I were to, um, it would have to be very large, um, and once again, not very much text. Um, and then, once again, back to uh, Arial, which is a, a, a fairly, standard, uh, fairly standard type. Um, the other kind of issue is line length, um, and what I mean by that is kind of the width of the column, um, how many letters, how many words are in that column, and this has a lot to do with, um, you know, the distance in which you're reading and a lot of other factors, um, but I wanted to kind of review that in choosing your type size, um, it's important to take into consideration your column width. Um, an ideal line length in book design um, is 66 characters, and that includes the spaces. Um, but the you know, lines can reduce as few as 45 characters in this column or extend up to 100, um, but it is important to consider how far your reader has to jump to travel from the end of the line to the beginning of the next line. Um, I saw that as a big problem in a lot of the examples that Neil had posted. The line is extremely wide. You have to read all the way over here, jump down, and kind of continue, um, continue your, your reading path, and that can be very that can be very difficult to do based on a variety of factors. Um, you know, this is, this is pretty tight. I don't know if I would go much tighter than this. Um, it gets really bad when you full justify it because now the spaces between the words are much larger than the space between the columns. Um, it's just this weird texture of craziness, so please don't do it. Um, if you do have to, for some reason, uh, justify your text, full justify, uh, please turn on hyphenation. Um, part of the reason that this is such a disaster is that longer words are not being hyphenated, um, and therefore those kind of inner spaces are being uh, exacerbated and just blown up a lot. Um, the nerdy thing that I like to tell all of my students is there's no justification for full justification without hyphenation. It's very catchy, I know. So just, yeah, don't do it. Um, so this is a, an example of a longer line length. Um, sometimes you, you just need that. Um, the, there are a lot of factors that you're dealing with in terms of 
imagery and titles and graphs and you're just like, I just, I need a longer line length that can't be 45. Um, even this one could potentially work, but if, if you're going to do that, um, it's important to kind of insert additional letting um, or line spacing between the lines. Um, a wider column requires additional letting, narrow column uh, less lead. Um, so here you can kind of see the, the difference between uh, the two. Um, it can be easier to kind of finish the, the line and jump, jump back to the beginning. Yes? Which type of documents? Latex documents. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not understanding. Latex, it's a, it's a typesetting. Oh, right. Can you, can you repeat the question? Yes, the question is um, that LaTeX documents offer a default kind of comfortable measure in terms of reading and. They look funny in that they have very small font size and probably two inch margins. Like right. Um, I haven't done a lot of work with LaTeX uh, personally. Um, I'm aware of it, but I haven't done a ton of work with it. Um, that's very possible that they've kind of addressed that. Um, there are different kind of pieces of software that I use on a regular basis that kind of deal with that. Um, I use a word processing program called IA Writer um, that adjusts kind of the column and the font size in conjunction with one another um, so that depending on how big your window is that it's, it's a comfortable measure. IA Writer. Um, it's a very kind of like bare bones word processing uh, piece of software. Um, and so, you know, some of these kind of funny terms that kind of persist with us. Uh, Letting actually talks about back when letters were made of lead and you would want more space between them. You'd actually put pieces of lead in between them to have more space. It's a very tedious thing. Sometimes I make my students do it. Um, so. In this context, um, the, uh, the justification isn't so egregious. Um, there's enough space kind of across this column that those word spaces, as they become elastic, can be a little less problematic. Um, so I would say like, you know, training yourself to like look at those issues um, can, can be really helpful in, in these kinds of things. Um, and so the width of the column, the size of the type, the amount of letting are all part of this typographic dance. Um, graphic designers agonize over these relationships. It's a little more letting here, a narrower column there, perhaps some slightly larger type. And all of these components relate to uh, one another to help us establish hierarchy, which was that term that Neil um, kind of spoke of. Um, and hierarchy, I've noticed, is where most folks kind of get into trouble. Uh, they don't necessarily have a problem with understanding um, information hierarchy, but they usually end up pushing too many buttons um, in order to establish those, those, dif those differences visually. And then what I mean by that is, um, you know, making things big, maybe making things red, um, maybe outlining something in a box, um, and, it gets, and it gets crazy. Um, and so graphic designers often refer to this phenomenon as belt and suspenders, um, which is redundant moves that are being made to accomplish the same task. Um, so you don't often need to wear a belt and suspenders at the same time. Um, and so I wanted to talk about sort of the, uh, the tools of hierarchy that, um, that we end up using. Um, Neil, Neil talked about these as well. Um, and a lot of times in, in, a, in a typography course, you know, I really challenge my students to investigate, you know, just one of these at a time before adding another one. Um, I think it's a good practice um, to kind of evaluate Okay, what do I really need to separate this from um, another piece of information? Um, so size, color, contrast, space. Um, size is, a, is a, a pretty you know, obvious one. Um, making something big separates it from something else, and perhaps that we can see that more easily. Um, color can also kind of separate these, um, these pieces of information from one another as well. Um, contrast, um, as you can see here, and then finally space by moving um, a piece of information away from maybe a cluster or a group can kind of isolate it and bring more attention to it. Um, so oftentimes just a shift in size is enough. Um, so think about your, fun your headlines um, and how are they trying to operate? Are they anchors? Are they mile markers? And what I mean by that is, you know, oftentimes these uh, make it big, you make it bold, you make it dark, you make it red. And it's hard to move beyond that. We've seen it, and we're stuck there. And I would consider that an anchor versus a mile marker, which is, as Neil was talking about, like letting us kind of 
take a scan over, over your poster, see pieces of information that kind of jump out at us, it allows us to keep our place, and then we can kind of continue to move through. Um, so with color, um, uh, and Neil talked about this as well. Um, we often think about color for its sort of emotional content, um, but I want to talk about the functional side of color as well. Um, this is in terms of uh, value and how it can make different pieces of information pop out or recede into space. Um, it has a lot to do with uh, you know, issues of contrast. Um, I'll show some examples here. Um, you know, just by graying out the word color, um, that kind of falls back. Um, we talk about our or work um, in this kind of abstract term where um, I talk about the, the sort of the picture plane. So even though this is a, a two-dimensional kind of surface that you're looking at, um, you're actually simulating depth. Um, you're actually simulating like the idea of looking through a window. So you know, if you think about this white text as being, maybe being um, stuck to the window um, that is kind of the screen, um, by graying that out, um, that word color is moved slightly back uh, into space. Um, this is a, a move that I like to do um, quite frequently um, with my headlines. Um, they're isolated, maybe they're bolder. They're a lighter color though, so I can see them quickly and then move into the text and actually be engaged in, in the reading experience and not get pulled back up to uh, that headline because it's shouting at me. Um, so issues of, of contrast can work in, in this world, um, in this world as well. Um, even the use of uh, a rule or a line um, that line all of a sudden becomes a, a thing to worry about. Um, that line can either hold you um, up at the word color before allowing you to kind of move through it, or it can uh, be augmented by, you know, then I have this, this crazy thing that says pop out, and there's like a lot of contrast there. So there's kind of, there's a lot to kind of think about. There's a lot to deal with. Um, but mostly it's kind of like thinking about the use of color as things that can come forward or, or recede into space. So I think that's a very kind of nice um, kind of tactical approach to it. Um, so contrast, um, I want to talk about you know, the visual voice of, of each typeface um, allow us, allows us to identify um, and, and define hierarchy through this contrast. Um, so by just changing the, the text of my, um, my body text to a serif typeface, using a sans for my, um, my headlines, it creates um, an immediate kind of recognition that, okay, this is a different type of content from this below. So, you know, this is a heading, this is kind of narrative text or however you want to kind of um, discuss it. And that becomes a recognizable pattern kind of throughout your, your poster. Um, that same thing can be um, dealt with with the same typeface with bold, you know, bolding it, um, making it a different color. But I think it's like looking for opportunities to, um, to create recognizable patterns throughout that, uh, throughout that reading experience. Um, space, um, Neil had a great example about the power of just like additional space um, between things and um, the tightness of space kind of creating a, uh, a set of relationships by grouping and proximity. Um, so sometimes just a shift in space can do enough to draw attention to different pieces of content. Um, you know, the examples of just kind of like pulling things apart um, kind of shifts your, shifts where your, your focus kind of ends up. Um, so I wanted to show some examples of uh, um, people who do this very, very well. Um, this is um, Nicholas Felton. Um, he's a RISD alum who um, is a great, um, he's a great graphic designer. He makes amazing kind of infographics. Um, this particular body of work uh, is a very peculiar thing that he started doing. Uh, he started making annual reports for himself. Um, so he would track different pieces of data. Um, it started with just kind of like looking at iTunes and be like, oh, look at the, the most played song or look, oh, look at all these photos that have been tagged. But then he got really kind of invested in kind of um, trying to kind of take that a lot further. So this is a, uh, the travel, I think, um, that he had done over the year. So. Um, you can see that there's information about subways, there's information about taxis, there's information about walking, there's information about buses. And he does a great job of kind of like using color and size um, to kind of bring things out and move things back. Um, I also, the, the way that his diagrams kind of like live in the space, I think is a great example. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, the difference between kind of having a diagram that lives in a, in a rectangle versus just kind of 
bleeding out into the space. Um, this is another example. Um, as he kind of progressed to the, that, he got really interested in like tracking how much time he spent with people and his relationships. So um, there's like different things that he has done with Olga <laughs> um, in New York City, everywhere uh, in the Bay Area. Um, it's very kind of uh, very. It's a very fascinating kind of take on and all of this kind of content. Um, here's the difference between with Ryan. It looks like he spent a lot more time with Olga uh, than with Ryan. Um, and so, you know, that example is kind of like, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of showcase like really cool work that is self-authored and, you know, he doesn't have the same kind of constraints or kind of issues that you guys do. Um, so I want to show um, some other examples um, that I think are really, really great. Um, and this was done for the Parks Department um, by Massimo Vignelli um, initially back in the 70s, I want to say. Um, and I think like the use of hierarchy and organization throughout these two examples are great. They're using a ton of, there's a ton of information on these things. Um, but like Neil said, like using captivating imagery, um, you know, not being afraid to use like a lot of real estate um, for an image to then kind of move you through these kind of chunks, using these bars to kind of separate content out. Um, and then as maybe you get a little bit more sophisticated, you can start breaking some of those, those grids. I think that's kind of a nice thing. You establish kind of normalcy, and then you kind of bust out of it every once in a while. So, you know, the bow right there, um, kind of breaking into that, helps these kind of feel a little bit more human and, and dynamic. Um, and so the underpinning of all of that is uh, the grid. Um, the, this is an example of the, the Unigrid system that they developed for the Parks Department. Um, so they were able to generate a lot of these different posters with kind of an underlying logic and structure. Um, and so the grid is an essential tool to graphic designers in all areas of layout. Um, it allows them to set, allows them a set of parameters to work within and helps with principles of organization that can help determine hierarchy. Um, so what I mean by that is a lot of times I'll like look at an afforded space that I have and kind of divide that up and then see, see how the, the information can, can live within that space. Um, so this is an example of the, the grid that exists kind of beneath this presentation, um, even though it's being used for a very kind of simple set of relationships of there's where the headline is, here's where some, some text is. Um, but that can be used um, to kind of support much more information. And it can give you a set of kind of guideposts and a set of rules that you can kind of follow. So, you know, if I want to showcase um, pieces of Nick Felton's work, um, I kind of know where that could or should go um, based on some decisions I'd made earlier um, with that grid. Um, I can even kind of switch things around with that. Um, I don't have to necessarily follow like top, bottom, bottom kind of, kind of hierarchy. Um, the grid can now support even these kind of figure annotations as well. Um, and even kind of more robust information. Um, so really kind of developing that grid structure and kind of sticking to it um, is, a, is a great way to kind of not go crazy um, when, de when dealing with like a lot of, uh, a lot of complex information. Um, so even, even with Felton's examples, um, you can kind of see the grids here um, in terms of um, you know, this image, this image lives in a, a two-column world, this image lives in a two-column world, that bigger image occupies a four-column world, and there's hierarchy that kind of gets assigned to these things based on saying, that's going to take one column, that's going to take two columns, that's going to take four, and it's a nice kind of reminder to yourself, like, what sort of importance you're um, ascribing to, to this, you know, these graphics or photographs or blocks of text. Um, and so this is an example where uh, some, some cleanliness um, in, that, in that sort of grid system could really kind of go a long way. Um, we have some really long line lakes. We have uh, a very kind of strange set of relationships for these, uh, these kind of titles that like lead into this. Um, and to, to Neil's point where he talks about kind of reading distances, th this doesn't really offer kind of like a jump like the closer you get. It's kind of like a wash of stuff, and then you walk up closer to it, and it's still kind of like the same wash of stuff. 
This one um, is more kind of clustered, which is nice, but there's a lot of kind of activity behind there that makes it really difficult to kind of settle um, into these boxes. I think it's, it's easy when you kind of make, a, make a, a grid system of some kind to just put everything in a box and then actually color that box or have an outline around it. Um, and I try to challenge my students to, to not do that, you know, like let, let that kind of grouping that you've done within that grid system kind of do that organization for you. Um, as, in, as in this example. Um, so this is a, um, another, another theme that I'd mentioned earlier. This is like the kind of the, the rectangle phenomenon. Um, you know, these graphs are on a, on a light color and when shown on a, on a dark background, they kind of occupy their own sort of little like rectangle, their own kind of um, space. Um, if I kind of flip that and now the background is more similar to uh, to the graphs, I keep stepping in front of that thing. Um, they kind of the the whole piece kind of breathes a little bit more. So you can see kind of maybe the use of, of color in some of the uh, the figures, for instance, um, in the name and how that can kind of relate to the graphs. And they feel like one kind of cohesive language within a uh, within a presentation or in your case maybe a poster. Um, these sorts of issues. Um, this is an example where. Uh, where that is actually starting to happen. Um, I remember looking at this example and being actually pretty, pretty excited that, um, you know, that this lives kind of within that green space. It's not, once again, within a white rectangle inside of a green rectangle inside of a darker green rectangle. Um, it's allowed to kind of breathe, and we can kind of like observe it and, and, and look through it. Uh, thank you. <laughs>